Welcome this morning. Yeah, we're a little short girls this morning and our talkers. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be brief. Welcome this morning. If you'd like to stand and worship with us this morning.
Good way to start this morning. Good morning. I'm Joy Muncy, and it's good to see you this morning for this Horizon service. Um, it's awfully warm already outside, isn't it? Gosh, pretty day, but whew, warm. Typical August, I guess. I have just a few announcements. I want to remind you that on September 9th and 10th, our youth will be having a yard sale those two days, and Kathy Matthews and the United Methodist Women are going to be providing baked goods for sale those two days. And if you're interested in helping with that, Kathy said to please contact her. Um, they would love it. And if you've got anything you want to get rid of, if you've got junk, furniture, uh, things that you just want to clean out of the attic or the basement, I know they would be glad to have, have the goods. Um, if you do, contact HB. There's a particular place in the church building where they're placing all of that until they get it outside. And then the following Wednesday on the 14th of September, Wednesday night Bible study from 6 until 7, we'll start back up again with Dale Gilbert um, in room 804, I believe. And I think that's all I had this morning. Oh, also in the... Um, in your newsletter, the What's Happening at Pleasant View, there's a write-up in there about uh, the flood victims in Kentucky. If you are interested in helping with that in any way, if, you've got a if you have the flexibility in your schedule and you can take some time away and go over there for a few days, there are some specifics in there as to how you can help, who to contact, and what the needs are. And I encourage you to look at that. And that's all the announcements I have this morning. you have anything? Okay. Good morning. Um, so uh, just a quick thing. Uh, a couple of y'all have asked about uh, the, the trip I took to Israel, the archaeological dig, and whether I was going to offer any of that information up. And I am. I've talked to Dale, and we set a date for September 16 uh, to share that. And so that's going to be, as, uh, I think it's the 16th. It's a Sunday night, whatever that Sunday is. Uh, so at 6 o'clock here at, at our Horizons Worship Center, uh, I'm just going to do a presentation that night uh, on the archaeological dig. So if you've ever wondered, is it Indiana Jones and do you have to have a fedora, I'm going to try and answer some of those questions. Uh, <laughs> so that's it. guys you know the routine let's get up and worship this morning we ask for the holy spirit to be with us this morning Thank you. 
never want to leave Well, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you just want you Today, there's two or three um, that I want to mention to you this morning. Uh, Wesley Kidd had surgery on Monday evening of this week and is still in the hospital. Uh, Sweet Pea Muncie, those that know him, we know him as Sweet Pea. He had his second knee replacement this week and he's home recovering. And Toby Toller, one of our youth that played bass in the praise band, had surgery this week and um, I want us to remember him as well. And Marjorie Tester that plays her keyboard and Roy, they're getting married today. And uh, I just want us to remember them uh, and their special day and, and uh, just their, their new life together. Um, in that song, it said something about sitting at the feet. Isn't it wonderful that we can sit at his feet anytime, anytime we want to. So let's pray together this morning. Father God, we thank you for today. And it's always good when we can come together and worship. What a privilege it is to be called your sons and your daughters and to come together and, and worship together and sing and pray and fellowship. Just this one small piece of the body. It's sweet and it's good. And, and we're just thankful, Father. And thank you, God, that we can come to you, come to your feet, and we can just lay it all out there cry and weep we can lay our needs out there and, and at the same time we can praise you and father we do praise you yes the needs are many and and the prayer list is long and, and father we thank you that you know every situation for each individual and their families and 
And Father, we do ask for healing where it needs to take place. And we ask for comfort and peace that only you can give in, in such a special way. But Father, we also have thank, much to be thankful for. And, and so we do offer our praises and our thanksgivings this morning. You are so good to us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And Father, we thank you for not giving up on us. We're the ones who put the distance between us. We're the ones who don't come to you often enough and talk enough. But Father, thank you for letting us start over when we need to. Every day, every day. Thank you for loving us that much. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your patience and for your love. But Father, especially thank you for Jesus. Thank you for a Savior in Jesus. Father, I thank you today for your holy word that we're going to read here in a little while and the message that you've laid on Dan's heart this week. Bless it. Bless our time together today and fill this place with your sweet spirit. I pray that our time together this morning will be sweet and good and that it really will be a time of worship. And that as we worship together this morning, that we'll continue to be open to whatever you have to say to us today. And when we leave here, may we say, mm, that was good. And not forget that where we go when we leave here today, we're still the church. Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the way you love us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, when I read it a few minutes ago, it reminded me of um, our scripture reading at the 830 service, which was from an Old Testament reading in Jeremiah. Um, very different, but yet I think the message will be very similar. Um, we have choices every day. Every, choice, every day we have choices. Um, so if you'll read along with me, this is Hebrews 13. Verses 1 through 8 and 15 and 16. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And in 15 and 16 it continues. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for with, which, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. This is the word of God today for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Thank you, Joy. Hey, so uh, good morning again. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Gray, and I'm the pastor here. Uh, it is great to see each of you. Uh, it's great to have you join us online, and we want to encourage you, if you're online, um, we hope that uh, just as we're praying for the Spirit to move here, uh, we're praying for the Spirit to move in your home or your living room, wherever you find yourself, uh, if you're on your phone at uh, McDonald's, <laughs> um, we just pray that God's Spirit speaks to your heart and mind too, and we want you to um, feel like you're part of this uh, 
joining in together to honor and praise God. Um, <clears throat> you got a favorite food? I got a favorite. <laughs> I got a bunch of favorite foods. I like to eat. Uh, what are some of your favorite foods? Cottage cheese. That is not what I expected. <laughs> Cottage cheese. I've never heard that, Teresa. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to praise God that someone loves cottage cheese and is eating all the cottage cheese I don't eat. <laughs> so, that's fantastic. What else? What are your some favorite foods? Mexican. I like Mexican. I'll eat Mexican with you. I won't eat cottage cheese with you. Sorry. I'll still go eat with you. Though. <laughs> we'll go to a Mexican restaurant and take cottage cheese there. How about that? <laughs> Chicken livers. Wow. Okay, I'm looking for like chocolate. <laughs> Steak, spaghetti, quesadillas, ice cream. Ice cream, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that. Brown beans and cornbread. I like that. I like that. I'm with you on that. Roast beef. Good old roast beef. All right. What else we got? Now, if you come to the Gray household and uh, we're going to serve you food, which we're not great at doing this. We, we just, um, not that uh, we're not decent cooks when we try. We just find we don't try a lot. <laughs> but usually what we find is we're, we're putting some uh, tater tots into the air, fry, <laughs> air fryer. Um, and so there's something about tater tots in the Gray household that when the tater tots get made, um, everybody's like standing there by the air fryer waiting for them to come out, right? Uh, so I don't know, tater tots might be a favorite in our home uh, collectively. You know, I could name some others, chocolate and uh, some other things. Peanut butter grew up just chomping down peanut butter all the time. Uh, do some sun butter now, interestingly. Yeah, uh, a little shift there, but uh, it's good. Um, all right, now think of your favorite food. And think of the moment you're about to get some of it, and you're really excited, and you've been thinking about it for a while, right? Uh, and you just can't wait to take that first bite. And then somebody walks up beside you and says, can I have some tater tots? <laughs> and what's your instinct? No, get your own. <laughs> yeah, that's my instinct. I'm like, man, let me at least eat a couple. Don't take, I've got seven tots here. Well, usually I have more than seven tots. But <laughs> I got a pile of tots here and there's only enough for me, you know. But that's our instinct, right? We want to um, not share is, is the, the nature that I think we all have in common. Uh, whether it's food or whether it's whatever we prize and love. There's something about us that, that I think it's just part of that human instinct that we have that maybe we're born into. Now, scientists will debate this. They'll say, you know, um, I was reading a, a psychological report the other day that said, you know, actually children aren't born selfish. And then some other psychologists are arguing, yes, they are in studies, et cetera. Uh, but that's been an ongoing debate, you know, in, in science and theology and philosophy and psychology. You know, are we naturally selfish or is it a learned behavior? Are we naturally selfish, or is it learned behavior? And, and honestly, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. And part of that is, is the worldview I hold as a Christian that recognizes that we are under the fall, the, the fall of humanity, and that there's a certain selfishness that we have and a certain um, sense of taking care of us that is not something that we're born as a blank slate with, but we come into the world with that bent. But I also want to say yes to... Um, it's a learned behavior too, because I truly believe that the scriptures also teach us that we are created, like the design of the human being is to be good. Uh, we see that in Genesis 1 and 2, that we are created in God's image and likeness, right? And that's a good design. That's a good thing. And we know that God is not selfish. We know that from scripture. So uh, I think we've got this mix in us, and there's this, this challenge going on inside of us. Um, in 1989, there was a guy named Robert Fulgram. Um, I, apologies if I mispronounce his name. But he wrote a book that became a New York Times bestseller, sold 7 million copies, was reprinted in multiple editions, worldwide circulation. All, let me get this right. All I really need to know, I learned in kindergarten. Has anybody read that book? You've probably heard of it, maybe. 
I know. Yeah, I've heard of it. I've not read it. Uh, but I, I was looking at uh, some of the things he listed. And number one, the things I learned in kindergarten, number one is share everything. So we recognize even that in our children we have to teach sharing from a very young age. Now, again, sometimes psychologists will, will find that, that some children have this tendency to be altruistic and to share. But for many children, younger than age five in kindergarten, we also see that desire to take and to grab. Uh, so I think it's, it's this thing. Uh, in case you're curious, some other things on the list. Play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess is in caps. I don't know if he capitalized that <laughs> or if the article I was reading capitalized it. Uh, don't think, take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush, that's important. Um, <laughs> I like this one, take a nap every afternoon. And there's others. Uh, but uh, there, I've probably spared you half the book. Uh, but it's supposed to be a really good book and a really good read if you want to go check it out. Uh, but I thought this was interesting. Even as an adult, Robert Fulgram knew that um, he knew what was good behavior, and he had a struggle with doing it, right? So he writes this book, and he helps millions and millions of people around the world understand that there are some basic things that are part of living that we think are good things to do towards one another. And sharing is at the top of that list. Is it nature or nurture? Yes. And I think one of the things that we hear in the scripture that Joy shared with us today from Hebrews is uh, the writer of Hebrews, uh, who was a Christian leader, and I'll talk a little bit in a moment about who that might be, um, is writing to the Christians to remind them to share. So even after they've accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, even after they've confessed him as, as God incarnate, um, that that community needs to be reminded to share. So we're going to look at some of the particulars of how they're reminded to share today. We're going to uh, hear in verse 16, just to remind you what it said. It said, do not neglect to do good, but share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, this is not a Robert Fulgram instruction book. This is not a reminder of what you learned in kindergarten. Because the, one of the things we're going to, acknowledge is sharing can be hard. He's writing a book as an adult man about sharing. And we all acknowledge that we have that tendency even today to share tater tots, right? I mean, how silly is that, right? But that's just something instinctual in us. So even once we've said yes to Jesus, I think that's still a challenge for us. Um, so we're going to talk about some of that challenge. We're going to see that this is not a, a do-gooder list, a, a how-to-be-a-good-citizen list, a how-to-make-your-kindergarten-teacher-proud-of-you list. Uh, but this is what it means, according to the Word of God, to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Last week, I, I spent some time talking about how Jesus unbends us and restores us to the fullness of life. Uh, and what Jesus calls forth from us in that point forward is a life that lives in the way that he would have us live, a life shaped and molded by his ethic. So I want to be careful here. Again, it's not a do-gooder list, but it is a set of expectations that God has of us as his people. And so we're going to talk about why that is, too, and how this list might be a little bit different from Robert Fulgham's list. It's Jesus trying to form and shape us. So we're going to look at a couple things today in this scripture. We're going to look at what, what is, what is this ethic of Christian behavior? And this is not meant to be, this is how you look as a Christian all completely, but it's just isolating in on this book of Hebrews. This is chapter 13, so there's been 12 earlier chapters. So if you want to spend the afternoon reading scripture, you might read chapters 1 through 12 and finish off 13 and, and see what uh, the writer uh, of Hebrews is addressing here. But we're going to talk about the what, and I see that broken down in a couple different ways. Uh, one is sharing in your hospitality, which is love towards strangers. So we're going to talk about that, and here we heard some of that in the scripture. Uh, the second way is sharing in respect for others. That's a giving when you give respect to others. And there are some very particular ways that the author of Hebrews names that as well that we'll look at. And then... Um, this one uh, I thought was interesting in the mix of this. Uh, it talks about being content 
in your lives. And if you think about that, that is a sharing too. Because if you're content with your lives and you don't have the love of money that's spoken of, then you can share and freely give generously with others. So there's a sharing message in there too. Uh, So those are the what's. We'll talk about why. Why do we do this? Well, the scripture tells us very plainly. It's in praise to God. It's our thanksgiving to God for God's goodness and God's generosity and God's sharing into our lives, uh, his love and his grace. And then at the end of the message, we might walk out of here still with some idea that this is still challenging, if we're truthful. That this is still hard to do, if we're honest. Am I going to share all my tater tots with you? I'm going to give you some of them. (laughs) But it's still going to, you know, push me a little bit to um, share with you when my instinct, when my nature as a human being is to hold tight that sense of scarcity. Uh, some evolutionary biologists say it, it's just how we are, you know, that, that we came uh, into the world, you know, having to scrape and scrounge for all that we have, and this is just a product of that. Um, I think there's more to the story than just our biology. Um, but how do we get past whatever it is, whether it's nature or nurture, how do we get past it? And the scriptures say through Jesus, and so we'll talk about that too. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on the Hebrew scripture here, just to kind of orient us to, because we're coming in at the end of the book here. Um, the author, uh, so this is New Testament book. The author uh, is probably not Paul. Some, some have thought Paul over the years, but probably not Paul. Um, Timothy's mentioned uh, in the letter. And so we think that it was probably a, a companion of Timothy, uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, you'll get different ideas on who the writer is. At the end of the day, we say we don't know, but it was someone who was in the circles of influence with Timothy, and Timothy was in the circles of influence with Paul uh, in his travels. So it may have been someone who traveled with Paul. Um, some different ideas offered are Silas, who traveled with Paul, Barnabas, who traveled with Paul, uh, Apollos, who was also a leader of the church in Paul's time, Paul, Apollos is mentioned in Corinthians. Uh, if you read uh, some of the uh, issues that Paul's trying to address, uh, he talks about Apollos in 1 Corinthians. Um, and here's another interesting one that I really love is um, Priscilla is mentioned as a possible author uh, for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to get into. That's not this sermon. But just know we don't know exactly who the author is. Uh, sometimes we're clear that Uh, Paul wrote most of the New Testament letters, um, but what we do know is this is a respected leader of the church because this letter is accepted into the canon of Holy Scripture that we believe God has given to the authors of Scripture. And so we honor it, and it was read in the early church and respected. It was sent first to a group of people uh, who he identifies as the Hebrews. Now, of course, they are Christian, so they are most likely, for the most part at least, people who have converted to Christianity from Judaism. And what we also see in the letter is that there's this pressure on them to go back to Judaism, to go back to some of the practices, to not have some of the distinctive hallmarks of what it means to be Christian. Now, I don't know uh, most of your personal backgrounds. I don't know if you've had that conversion experience from Judaism to Christianity, Uh, But I do know this about us. Um, We feel a pressure in our culture uh, to give up some of the distinctiveness of Christianity. So I think this message really speaks to us today, that that this is not just a historical document that uh, records what it was like 2,000 years ago in the early church, but this is a word of God to speak into our hearts and minds today as we peer in to what the writer says, um, the word of God for us, God's people. So let's talk about the what's. What does it mean to share what you have? Uh, and we're going to talk about hospitality, respect for others, contentment with your life. Okay? Hospitality first. Uh, now this is more than inviting people over for tea and cookies. right? Uh, when we think of hospitality, we're thinking, okay, the next time I throw a big party, I'll be very generous and welcome everybody in grand ways, and I'll be hospitable. Or maybe it's uh, you know, on a more uh, private nature, a personal nature, where you invite some friends over for dinner, and you really roll out the red carpet for them. And certainly that is hospitality. 
But I want to explore this hospitality a bit, but let's go back to the verse first and hear it again. Do not neglect. Now, we heard this in different ways, and it's translated different ways. The translation that uh, Joy was reading from is actually a little bit different from what was on the screen, which is actually a little bit different from what I have in, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, but I want to read this verse to you, and then we're going to talk about it. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, that word, um, I think in one translation, it says, do not neglect to entertain strangers. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. That word, uh, the Greek word, so we're always translating in the New Testament from Greek to English. And sometimes we don't have the exact word that, that fits, or sometimes that word can have different meanings. But it's translated entertain, uh, be hospitable to. Uh, and, and the idea uh, that we get from this, the Greek word um, philozenia, um, and, and let me back up there, xenia, you probably heard of the word xenophobia when you have this fear of others, right? You know, whether it's uh, people outside your circle, you have a fear of them, whether it's people of a different race, whether it's people of a different nation, some kind of xenophobia where you have a fear of others. This is the opposite of that. Philo, which is a form of love. Xenia. So it's love of strangers. So what the scripture is really getting at is hospitality, entertaining strangers, is to show them love on a deeper level. Not just tea and cookies, but there's something deeper here. The Bible is saying to us that if we are Christians, we're going to look for strangers, whether it's in the room today. If there's somebody you don't know, maybe you can practice some stranger love on them. Not strange love, but stranger love, right? Good love. Uh, and, and, and do something that makes them feel welcome. Go out of your way to do that, is what the scriptures are inviting us to. But not just the people that, that come into our presence, but it's inviting us to see the strangers in the streets and in the communities that we live and serve in and walk in and work in and shop in and to offer love to them. So sometimes I don't think entertain or hospitality has enough gravitas here. This is about loving the strangers. And if you listen to our cultural narrative, that's not what we hear a lot of times. You know, it's like protect yourself, guard yourself, don't look them in the eye, they're going to ask for something from you, right? Or maybe we just have that instinctive desire not to associate. And what Jesus is telling us in his scripture today is to be a follower of him, we need to find a love for the stranger that ever comes that desire to separate and get away from. It's going to take us outside of our comfort zone. It's going to take us outside of what we feel good doing sometimes. You know, that might be your response is, well, I don't feel comfortable going up to so-and-so and offering them, you know, this. Something might happen to me. And I can't guarantee you something won't. But I do know the call of Jesus, as he demonstrated, is to show love to the stranger and something happened to him. Right? It's a challenging thing. But Jesus calls us as his followers to be open to the other. So more than just saying hello in worship to somebody you don't know. Maybe it's inviting them to lunch today, right? Or maybe it's just saying, hey, I don't want to be like all freaky stalky, but, you know, hey, you know, if I can just like get your contact information and reach out to you next week, I just want to see how you're doing and how your experience was here. That might be ways to show hospitality here. I mean, should it not be the case that every single church of Jesus is known as the most hospitable place in the community? And is that how we're known, or do we rush in and rush out because we got 10 billion things to do? Because we're busy? We got appointments to keep? We got things that are on our schedule, and they don't permit us to take the time to love the stranger? What about when you're driving out of here and heading down to the restaurant? You're encountering probably a, a waiter or waitress you haven't met before, a stranger. 
I mean, maybe you're a regular, you know, and <laughs> they know you. But for many of us, that encounter is going to be meeting a stranger. And how do we offer them love in that interaction? This is the kind of stuff the gospel gets into. It's not just like showing up at church and then welcoming the, the guest, which is, I think, very important. I think a sign of God's presence when we do that. How do we do that in our everyday lives? When you're out in the grocery, you know, are you like trying to whiz by somebody because they're going slow in front of you with their cart? Or are you somehow showing love to the stranger, patiently waiting on them to do what they got to do? Hospitality, showing love to strangers. The other form of sharing that we hear in this scripture is uh, respect for others. And there are three particular ways that the, the writer, the scriptures, give this to us. Uh, verse 3, remember those who are in prison. And you say, okay, well, yeah, I don't usually remember to pray for people in prison, but I'll try to do that. And so you write prisoners on your list. <laughs> the verse continues, though, as though you were in prison with them. Remember those who were in prison as though you were in prison with them. So prisoners is one of the groupings of people that we share respect with. Uh, but I want to keep reading the, next, the, the continuation of verse 3. And remember those who are being tortured as though you yourself were being tortured. Now that word gets translated different ways too, and in the reading Joy shared, it was a little bit different from this NRSV, but that word tortured, that word uh, persecuted, um, victimized, abused, uh, is what the, the, the Greek word is getting at there. So remember those who are in prison and remember those who are victims. This was written at a time, and this is where setting and historical context becomes so important to inform our understanding of Scripture. This is written in a time when Christians are beginning to experience some persecution for following Jesus, for saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. They're getting pressure and they're getting um, some blowback in their lives. It's having a negative impact on them. And some of them have landed up in jail. I mean, we know Paul many times landed up in jail for proclaiming Jesus. And so the scripture calls us to remember Paul and the others, not just the believers, but especially the believers, as though we were there with them. Now, this isn't just saying a prayer for them. This is saying to identify with them as if you share the cell with them. And I don't want to pretend that the prison system today is a good system, but it's probably just a tiny bit gentler than it was in the first century. Nobody cared about your clothing. Nobody cared about your amenities. Nobody cared about your food. And what this scripture is calling forth from the Christian community is go to those in prison as if you were there and take them the things that they need. Share respect with them. And for those who are being beaten and tortured and victimized, for those who are suffering, you identify with them too. You care for their needs and you provide for their needs. Respect for them as well. And then the scripture like takes this, this almost strange turn and, and, and the writer starts talking about marriage. You're like, wait, we were, we were just talking about prison and persecution and not that marriage is prison or persecution. Don't get that message. That is not what the gospel says. But it's still about respecting the other because hear that um, passage again. Let marriage be held in honor, respect, by all and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterers to honor to respect is what is being called for in that scripture too and in some ways this scripture kind of covers the waterfront you know if you don't have a relationship with anybody in prison if they're a stranger to you which I imagine is true for most of us I think the scripture is calling out some kind of relationship that we're going to begin to have with someone 
I mean, if you're like me, you've known people who've served in jail. You've known people who've come out of jail and still suffer from some of the behaviors that got them into jail. Or maybe they're suffering uh, from addiction still. Consequences of choices made in younger lives. And our tendency, and I think this is part of our selfish nature, is to guard ourselves and protect ourselves a little bit and close that off and not get into somebody else's mess. And Jesus is saying, I go into the mess, and I'm calling you to go with me, to offer some life and to show some respect. So whether it's prison or the victim, or whether it's the intimacy of the marriage bed, In all of these relationships, in all of these social relationships, we're called to show respect. And that's rooted in who Jesus is, God incarnate, and who Jesus is helping us to become. Remember we talked about the design of who we are? That design is made in God's image and likeness. And so this sharing of respect, this this showing of love toward the other is to say to them, I see in you that you are made in God's image and likeness. That's not the way of our culture. Our culture is to marginalize and cast aside those who are lesser, who are poor, who are not as powerful as, who have done misdeeds, who have cast themselves on the bad side. And we just leave them there because it's easier. But to show respect for others is to open up our lives and to step into theirs as if we were with them. It's not just being a pen pal with somebody in jail. But it's a deeper kind of calling. Jesus is teaching us that Christians show respect in all forms of relationships because we see in one another the image and likeness of God, another form of sharing. The third one that we talk about in the scripture is contentment with your life. And that seems odd because that seems kind of about you, right? The scriptures say be content with your life. Now, it's not saying be a doormat for everybody to take advantage of you and abuse you, those kind of things. But it's saying look at what you got and be content. Now, again, I don't think the scripture is saying if, if you live in poverty and desperation, be content with that. That's not what the scriptures teach. But verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because contentment is not just about you. If you have a contentment in life with with the things that God has given you, that allows you to share with others. It allows you to be open to them and to see their needs. And again, I think this is not the way of humanity. This is not the way of our culture. Our culture is to grab and get and see what else we can get next because that's where we think we're going to find happiness. Jesus is saying that's going to be empty. And so be content in God. Be content in your relationship with God and trust God. Because here's what it says. Let me find my verse. For I am with you always, and I will never forsake you. And whether it's a physical need or an emotional need or a spiritual need, if you know that God is present with you, there's a source of contentment there that the world doesn't have. I was reading the story of a Christian businessman who's really well off. And he said that he and his wife give away to God's work and to the uh, people in need 70% of their annual income. Seven, zero percent. And I'm stunned by that. And if you're listening to what I just said, your mouth should drop like mine. That's unheard of. You know, in the scriptures, the scriptures teach that 
our contentment with God's generosity in our life should lead us to give 10%. And if you look at statistics of how the average church member gives, it's less than 2% of their annual income. The risk of talking about money is, you know, we turn it into legalism. And we say, well, if I can just get from my 9 to my 10%, I can check it off and God will be pleased and I'll satisfy God's demands and God will bless me. But that's totally missing the point. We give our percentage, whatever it is, our 10%, our 70%, not because we're trying to meet a checklist that God has given us. Not because God is some draconian God that wants to take our joy away that we find in our money, our security away. But we do it because we recognize God is generous. And that's where the sharing is allowed. So the contentment that we have in God and what God provides for us allows us to be open-handed with others, to share with those in need to give to the work of the church. And I think this is no accident. You know, in this short little passage of Scripture, we hear that God is interested in our relationships of power, you know, whether folks are in prison or not, our systems of justice. God is interested in our sexual relationships that we have with others. God is interested in our relationship with money. God's really getting at it, isn't he? Really messing with us a little bit, right? Because what the scripture is trying to do is form and shape us to be more like Jesus. This is what Jesus demonstrated, and this is what he calls us to. A sharing, which is a generosity rooted in love that offers hospitality to others, love of the stranger, that offers respect for others in all relationships that offers generosity to others, contentment with what we have. Why do we do this? Verse 15 and 16. Through Jesus, then... Oh, let me tell you what this businessman said. I thought this was interesting. He was asked, like... Because, I mean, people are stunned. You know, why do you give 70%, you know? If you just want to give 10%, that should satisfy God. And he said this. He said, you have to understand... If a person making $30,000 a year gives away 10%, that's a sacrifice of lifestyle. We're making out very well. My wife and I give away 70%, and that's not a sacrifice. All that it does is keep us from escalating our lifestyle. I thought that was so fascinating. Why do we do this? Verse 15 and 16. Through Jesus, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise. That is, the fruit, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good or to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Verse 15 again. Continually offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that confess his name. The call of the Christian life is not just to say, I love Jesus, and to come here and sing songs, which is good and important, and thank you, band. Aren't y'all, like, just loving the band? (laughs) You guys are just getting better and better, and it's really cool. Uh, And thank you for leading us in worship. But that's not the purpose of just being a Christian. That's an important part of it. But you don't, like, you're not going to meet the fullness of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God if you just show up on Sundays and sing some songs. Or you just show up on Sunday and and try to pay attention to the speaker. (laughs) Part of what God is trying to do is to transform us and change us with every encounter, whether it's here on Sunday morning or in our daily lives. And it's taking on these practices that will help us become transformed and changed to be more like Jesus. So we offer it, not just confessing in name only, but to bear fruit, as we heard in the scripture. To have something about our lives that shows evidence that there's more to this than just saying some nice words or singing some nice songs on Sunday morning. 
And here's the thing. It's worship. You heard twice in that set of two verses the word sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews writing to people who grew up Jewish and saying to them, this is your sacrifice. No longer is the Israelite sacrifice that involved animals needed to worship God. Christ has been our once and for all sacrifice that redeems us, but out of thanksgiving when we come to worship God to say, thank you, God, we too are invited into sacrifice. Not to redeem ourselves, but to say thank you. A very important distinction. We sacrifice in praise and thanksgiving to God for what God has done. So that's the why of living this way. It's in thanksgiving. It's recognizing God's generosity and goodness and the love of Christ poured out on a cross to redeem us from our sins. And so we look at that and our jaws drop because that's more than 70%, y'all. That's God all in to save us. God 100% in with his love and his grace and his mercy for things we don't deserve. Saying, I love you. And I want you to be raised up from the, into the fullness of life. And so in response to that, we come in thanksgiving and offer these sacrifices of praise. Is it a sacrifice? Yes. The scriptures tell us that. That's, that's noting that we don't like to share. It's a sacrifice when I give up a tater tot. <laughs> At least in my head. Nobody else's, right? <laughs> I get that. It's a fast sacrifice when Teresa gives up a spoonful of cottage cheese. <laughs> right? <laughs> but name whatever it is that you love and you desire, whether it's food or money or comfort or luxury, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when we're called to give up, that's a sacrifice. And so the scripture recognizes that. And it recognizes that this is still going to be hard. Just because you said yes to Jesus, because you've said the words, I confess Jesus is my Lord, doesn't mean like some switches turn. Like It's not like flipping a light switch and all of a sudden you're like this wonderfully remarkable person you know, who always does good and, and speaks pearls and showers love. It's a life of growing in faith. And so we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to screw up, and we're going to mess up, and we're certainly going to screw it up and be selfish and hold tight our tater tots if we don't listen to this verse. Through him. Through him. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise. Jesus is the one who empowers you to live a life that shares. Jesus is the one who empowers you by the gift of his spirit not to be so stinking selfish. Jesus is the one who calls you forth, and where he calls you, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will go with you and before you to prepare a way. I will enable and empower you with the same spirit that spoke creation into being. So when you say, I can't give up a tater tot, Jesus says, yes, you can. And if you trust me, you'll do it. You'll share, you'll be generous. The invitation to sharing is empowered by God and called forth by God, not just so that we'll become better people and end up on the do-gooder list in our community billboards, but it's an invitation to give witness. Because here's the truth of the matter. People are watching you. Whether you know it or not, people watch how you live. And if you confess Jesus with your lips, he's saying, hey, there's more to it than that. Bear some fruit. Show some fruit into the lives of these people so that they can see my goodness and my grace and my mercy. And friends, that's a form of sharing. We are people called to share it in response to God's generosity. 
that has been shared with us. That invites us to some next steps. If you're one who's spiritually curious, if you're not quite sure about this Jesus guy, I want to encourage you today to just trust him and make a decision to commit to him and surrender. You don't have to have it all figured out. But when we talk about the values of God and sharing and the goodness of God and, and, and the, the things that God values, love and mercy and grace, we all go, yeah, that sounds good. I want some more of that. But the way we receive that is through holding out our hands and saying, I surrender, God, and fill me up with what you have for me. And that's your invitation today if you're one who doesn't know Christ. But let me say this too, if you're one who does know Christ, that's the same invitation for you. To hold out your hands and say, God, these are hands that grab and cling and hold tight. And I want you to open them and help me release and be open and sharing. And let me commit to you a little bit more. Let me grow more into your likeness and your image and being. And let me give that witness to others so that they can come into your grace and know what a generous, loving, sharing God you are. Will you pray with me? I'll invite the band to come up as I'm praying. God, we, uh, we love you, not like we should, but we come with our meager selves and our meager lives and our messed up lives and our troubled lives and our selfish lives and our sinful lives. We come trusting. We come trusting in the words of your scripture that teach us of your grace and your mercy and your generosity and your sharing that invites us into the fullness of life. So God, for each person here, for each person who's joined us online, help us receive that gift that through Jesus we might become the people you would have us be. We might become people who are known as generous and giving. We might become the people who respect others, who have contentment in our own lives so that we might share with others, who offer hospitality and love, not just to the people we like, but to the people we find strange. We're yours, God. We offer it to you. And pray these things in and through Jesus our Christ. Amen. Still
generosity I've received and I'm going to let it flow through me because I'm going to share that with others so then go to share love and life respect open handed seeing in the other the image and likeness of God go in the power of God to do these things not in your own strength for we just sang great is your faithfulness great is your faithfulness I will never leave or forsake you God goes with you and before you. Go in peace to love and serve all that you need. Go in the name of Father, Son, 